Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Church this morning. Uh, do click on notes and you'll see the order of service there in the sermon notes. Do click on live prayer if you'd like someone to pray for you. We're going to begin our service using some, a couple of verses from the book of Revelation that we can declare together. I'll begin and then you join in with the bits for everyone. We stand before the throne of God with countless crowds from every nation and race, tribe and language. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour, power and might, be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. And so we pray together. Loving God, we worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have our first song, which uh, tells us of how God is building together the church, brick after brick. God used to dwell in a house among his people, but now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place. the rock on which everything's depending he's making sure his house is steady as can be his love is strong and his promise is unending and he'll protect his church from all their enemies break after break god is building his temple break after break the sure foundation and his people as the stones he is building a place he can live break after break all his people gather round singing out the joyful sound giving glory to their maker and they build each other up as they share the bread and cup to remember their Savior. Brick after brick, brick after brick after brick, brick after brick, brick after brick after brick after brick. God is building His temple. foundation and his people as the stones he is building a place he can Throughout November, we've been thinking about remembering and significant things in the Bible that God tells his people to remember. So we thought at the beginning of November about, um, about Passover and how God's people were to remember his rescue of them out of Egypt by every year eating roast, what was it? Roast lamb, that's right. And then uh, we had Remembrance Sunday. And then last Sunday, we thought about uh, the Israelites going around the land, getting to the River Jordan and seeing stones set up and saying, what are they all about? And then remembering that God had brought them through the River Jordan on dry land by stopping the river miraculously and bringing them through on dry land into the promised land. Well, this week, 
we're going to think very briefly about something that Jesus tells us to remember. And he tells us how to remember it. He says, you're to take bread and you're to take wine. And he says, you're to eat and drink and to remember. Remember what? Remember his death. And there are words that we use from the Bible, from 1 Corinthians 11, which help us as we remember uh, what Jesus did. And so we often use these when we take communion. So I'm going to read out some verses. It's 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. And children, whenever the word remembrance is read out, poke a grown-up, all right? Poke an adult and say, it says remembrance, but poke the grown-ups when I say remembrance. You have my permission. Here we go. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So how many times did you poke the adults in the room? It was twice, wasn't it? Because it says remembrance twice. Don't do it again. Um, and that's what we're doing when we take communion. It's an act of remembrance. Sometimes people get the wrong idea of what's going on. They say the bread becomes Jesus's body and the wine becomes Jesus's blood and they think you're making a sacrifice and that this is an altar. Well, it isn't. All we're doing, what we're doing is we're remembering Jesus's sacrifice when he died on the cross. This isn't an altar, it's a communion table and the bread stays bread and the wine stays wine, but we remember what Jesus did for us and the meaning of it, that he died for us in our place. So that's what we do when we're taking communion. It's an act of remembrance. Well, boys and girls, you're just about to head off to your Zoom groups for Jam and Pathfinders. But before you do, just something to let you know about uh, for next week, because next week, beginning of Advent, we'd love you to make an Advent wreath at home. If you can do that in your households, if all households could do this, that would be great. You can use whatever you like. Use branches, use leaves, use Lego, use Play-Doh, whatever you like. Make an Advent wreath and uh, we'll have one here in the building as well. And uh, you'll need that for then next Sunday's all age slot at the beginning of the service. I'm going to pray for us as children head out to their groups. Let's pray. Father, please teach us whether we're going to Pathfinders or Jam or staying in the main service. Father, please would you be our teacher. Amen. So boys and girls, off you head and uh, we're now going to have an interview with Brian and Joan Mayhew, who are members of our church family. Uh, Brian and Joan, uh, what encouragements have you had? What encouragements in your faith have there been uh, over lockdown? Well, the fellowship with believers has been able to continue in a, in a rather unexpected way, as, as you most of you know, through things like Zoom. Um, and so we've been able to carry on with online services um, and particularly with holding home group meetings. Um, which we've both found very encouraging, um, particularly as our home group is now spread over multiple countries. So we can actually now have um, home group meetings, including Anne in Spain, as well as uh, our friends and colleagues around the area. Um, so that has been particularly encouraging um, to continue to look at God's word um, uh, almost uninterrupted, although without the, the benefit of seeing each other in person. But that has been particularly um, encouraging, uh, as have the the online services. Uh, uh, it's it's been a it's been a real blessing. It really has. I think during the first lockdown, um, the time to enjoy God's creation um, and to hear God's creation as well, because obviously there wasn't as much um, traffic during that first lockdown, and it was just wonderful going for walks in that amazing weather that we had during that first lockdown. Um, and seeing God's creation as spring turned into summer and then hearing the birds and hearing the sounds of nature, that, that was wonderful. Um, and I think daily quiet times as well, um, they seem to have been more focused mm. and, um, and getting encouragement through God's word as well. 
um, because of those those daily quiet times, that's been encouraging. So are there particular truths about God that have encouraged you in your quiet times? Um, I think some various passages. Um, I mean, we, we shared some passages uh, at home group, actually, on this, this week in... Um, there's one in two Thessalonians. Uh, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, God our Father who loves us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And I think also um, the Romans passage where it says that nothing can separate us from the love of God and the love of Christ, not even a global pandemic, nothing can separate us from that love. Wonderful reminders. Um, I'm sure it's not all been easy for you during lockdown. Uh, what have been some of the challenges that you've faced? I think the biggest is being apart from family and friends, um, especially our, our youngest daughter, Laura, lives in Edinburgh. So it's been difficult not being able to go up to see her and, and she's not been able to come down to see us, obviously. So that, that's been particularly difficult, I think. And not being able to give people hugs, that's difficult as well. Yes, particularly... Um, well, we can hug each other, obviously. We, we can, yes. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad you are. Yes, we don't have to do that by Zoom. No. <laughs> um, uh, for the first lockdown, I was actually working uh, uh, pretty much full time at home. So it, the time just seemed to whiz by. I was very lucky in that respect. Um, and particularly um, the time taken to record the various songs for the online services. That, uh, you know, it's, it's quite time consuming and uh, very absorbing. So... Um, they were both those were challenges in their own right but they were also they provided a, a relief in a way from from the, the realities uh, of, of lockdown as many people experienced it and i think um the realities of the lockdown and, and what it means you know that the global pandemic i think that's caused us both to have um, meltdowns on a couple of occasions um, when the enormity of the whole thing and, you know, when will it be over sort of just gets a bit too much. So I think we've, we've both had a, a meltdown once or twice, but um, we've recovered. <laughs> I'm glad to say. Um, no, leading well. online home groups is not the easiest thing. Um, it's very rewarding, but it can be quite a strain staring at a screen for an hour or so. Um, and I'm sure other people find that as well. Um, particularly uh, when there's another Zoom meeting to go to uh, before or afterwards. Um, so you get a bit zoomed out after a while. But um, again, the um, the benefits seem to outweigh the, 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 the problems there. I think for me, as a, as a member of the pastoral care team, um, knowing how to support people in the church, um, you know, the vulnerable, the elderly, this, the sick in the church through a lockdown, how do we do that? That's that's been quite challenging. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you for your honesty in saying that, of course, you know, we do have times, we do have meltdowns at times and maybe particularly over these last few months uh, in lockdown. You mentioned in there about recording songs for the services. Uh, thank you for doing them. Uh, we'd love to know uh, just a little bit about how you go about doing them. Would you tell us how you do them? Uh, sure, sure. You've seen, you can see in the background there's some another computer glowing away there. I'll just take you over there and I'll, I'll show you what goes on. Over at the music computer, all instruments of a song have to be recorded separately. So we build up a song in, with all the instruments uh, one at a time, usually starting with the piano. Um, in a song we did recently, um, the, Lord, the Lord is My Salvation, um, the piano started like this. Then when that's finished we record a flute and then other instruments, strings and drums. Until we have a full backing track. That process can take about a day, um, surprisingly, um, after which uh, the voices can be recorded on top of it. So then it's over to me. Um, so I hear that backing track in through these headphones and then we usually record the song a verse and a chorus at a time um, and if I get something wrong um, we have to go over it and re-record it. Um, sometimes we add some harmonies or some descants. Uh, that process usually takes about an hour and then once that's done it's back to Brian. 
and we end up with a finished track which sounds something like this. So after about a day and a half we end up with a song which takes about three minutes to sing. Great fun. Thank you so much uh, for doing all that and doing it so that we can have songs so that we can sing God's praises uh, if we're not in the building uh, and that we can join in doing that together. Thank you for all that you put in. Um, what can we be praying for you? I think top of the list is that whatever happens we keep our eyes fixed on God and we seek his guidance in all things. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And um, in practical terms, uh, there's still music to arrange and record, um, particularly for Christmas. Prayer. It's, it's not just a technical thing, as we've seen. It's uh, There's a whole inspirational thing there, you know, to try to make the things interesting. And sometimes the juice, juices just don't flow. So um, that's, um, that's definitely a, a cause for prayer there. Mm. And for us to take one day at a time, mm. trusting in God's providence, I think, as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Brian and Jane. Thank you for all that you do uh, for us. Uh, and thank you for this interview. And we'll certainly pray for you. Thank, thank you. you. Let's just take uh, 30 seconds uh, to pray for Brian and Joan. And now David and June Cruden are going to lead us in our prayers. We turn now to think of things we have done or not done and to ask for God's forgiveness. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done wrong things that hurt you. We are sorry and turn away from what we have done wrong. Have mercy because you love us. Wash away what we have done wrong and clean us from our sin. Put our thoughts and hearts in line with yours and make us joyful because you have saved us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul tells us, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We turn now to prayer. Let us pray. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth II, for wisdom in her words and in deeds during lockdown. Pray for our government, for our Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the government that they will make the right decisions for the whole of the United Kingdom. Pray for the Church, for our Bishop Richard Cheatham, that he will support the Church ministers and all parishioners as we continue with this second lockdown, and for our Minister Bart Elbart as he serves our community. We use National Prayer Day on Thursday to pray for the world to be at peace from war, the virus, and for healing. Pray for Emmanuel and her sister church, Christ Church, as they open for individual prayer. Pray for scientists, as the world scientists develop vaccines for the virus that will save lives and we go back to work and socialize again. Pray for the NHS, as they continue to save lives and slowly open their doors to people that need their services. Pray for those who are suffering with mental health issues, that they will get the help they need. Pray for the people who are unwell with COVID-19, cancers, heart disease and liver diseases, that God will heal them. We close our time of prayer by saying together the words our Lord himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, David and June. Uh, we're now going to affirm what we believe. This isn't one of the creeds, but it's taking words from 1 Corinthians 15 and it's declaring it, words that are about Jesus's life, death and resurrection. And it's declaring it saying, we believe these truths from God's word. So if you'd like to do stand and do join in with the bits for everyone, if these are truths that you believe. This is the gospel which we received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 at the same time. On this gospel we take our stand. Please have a seat if you are standing. We're now going to have a video just to uh, introduce you to what we're planning on doing with Christchurch in Advent. So Bart and I are sitting down over Zoom uh, to share with you how we're partnering together this Christmas um, as two churches. And before we get into that, Bart, uh, I wonder what's the most unexpected gift you've ever received? Uh, thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to partnering uh, with you guys on this. Yes, the most unexpected gift I've ever received. Um, well, uh, there have probably been several, but one was when I was training for ministry. I was on placement at a church um, and we went for dinner with a family. And I must have mentioned at some point how expensive theological books are, um, because uh, sometime later, these people who we didn't know very well gave me, I think it was about £500 towards buying theological books, which was amazing. So it, it's all these books behind you, um, which was an unexpected gift. Uh, Anil, what about you? Uh, so when I was a young boy, we had an airing cupboard uh, and one Christmas um, I found before Christmas, maybe November, in that airing cupboard, uh, a stuffed toy that I really wanted. And my mum convinced me completely, she lied, convinced me that that stuffed toy was for another kid. And I got very jealous. And then lo and behold, on Christmas Day, I unwrapped the paper around the box and inside was this, which was Snarf from the Thundercats, who has been my bedside companion for 30 odd years since, so that's uh, that's my unexpected gift. It, it looks great, it looks amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> but on that tenuous link uh, for this Advent, uh, we'll be using the Sunday readings from a new Advent devotional called The Christmas We Didn't Expect uh, as the scripture readings for our sermons uh, over this season uh, to help our churches together to lift our eyes to Jesus. And here's a clip from the author, David Mappis, telling us a little bit about this book. Most of us feel fragile exhausted and burdened this time of year. We are not unlike those who waited for the promise of that first advent. And that's where I wanna take you in the Christmas we didn't expect. I've written 24 daily readings from December 1st to 24th on the wonder of Christ's incarnation in hopes of lifting our weak and weary souls to the one who came to save. Yes, we really want to recommend uh, this book. It is uh, really helpful for us at taking us to the Lord Jesus. Uh, he says that Christmas isn't just magical, it's miraculous. It is far greater than we can imagine because God himself took on flesh, became one of us. And we can become over familiar with that idea, but it is incredible. And this book really helps you to grasp how incredible that is. I found it uplifting. I think if you're a Christian, you'll find it, it uplifting. If you're not yet a Christian, it'll be really good for helping take you to Jesus and to explain what Christmas is really all about. So it's a really helpful book and I want to commend it to you. Oh, I'm really excited to get stuck into that with our church family here. So uh, if you are able, why not pick up uh, a copy of this book from the Good Book Company website uh, and follow along with it on your own, uh, perhaps with your family or maybe even in your small groups uh, along with our churches. Uh, and join us, join us on Sundays as we use this book as the basis for our sermon series in Advent starting on Sunday, the 29th of November, where we will share the readings and sermons between our churches as we wonder 
at the unexpected gift of Jesus this Christmas. Join us then. Jen Manhire is now going to read our reading for us from Amos chapter 9 and then Chris is going to preach for us. The reading today is Amos chapter 9. Please follow along in your Bibles. Amos chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing by the altar and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. Bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away. None will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of the grave, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises like the Nile, then sinks like the river of Egypt. He who builds his lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. Are not the Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaptor, and the Arameans from Kir? Surely the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth, Yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword and those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. In that day I will restore David's fallen tent I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church, and thank you, Jen, for reading Amos chapter 9 for us. The final chapter of Amos is upon us, and it's been a journey of judgment, both for the nation of Israel and for the church, and even for us. We have seen that God hates impartiality. He hates when we treat people differently because of their background or their upbringing. He has spoken through Moses through various pictures and prophecies showing that the house of Israel would be removed forever. And today we see the finality of that prophecy and the hope that God brings with it. In this chapter, we will see the severity of God's judgment, the supremacy that God has to fulfill that promise, the shaking sieve of God's mercy and the salvation promise for our future. Let's begin with the severity of God's judgment, verses 1 to 4. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. 
bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away, none will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of the grave, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, there I command the serpent to bite them. And though they are driven into exile by the enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. This is the promise that God finally says, you have no more chances. You have sinned too far and now you must pay the price. No one will escape. No one shall have a respite. No matter where you hide, you will receive God's judgment. No grave, no sky, no mountain, no sea, no country will be able to be safe for these people to hide. God says he has fixed his eyes on them for evil and not for good. <sighs> Remember, this prophecy was specifically directed towards the northern kingdom. The ten tribes of Israel, and God is speaking directly to that nation, no longer with pictures like ripe fruit from last week or the locust, the fire, and the plumb line from two weeks. Time is now up. And he is speaking directly to them. And his final word means destruction and death. There is nothing here showing any chance of repentance or restoration. In the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah's time was up, so now the northern kingdom had to pay for their sins. He's finished with his warnings and now the punishment is coming. Israel will be destroyed. And according to this entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica, following the conquest of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 721 BC, the ten tribes were gradually assimilated by other peoples and thus disappeared from history. The northern kingdom has been wiped off the face of the earth. God said that he would do it, and he did it. How and why? Let's look at verses 5 and 6 and see the supremacy that God has to fulfill this promise. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, he who touches the earth, and it melts, and all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises like the Nile, then sinks like the river of Egypt. He who builds his lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. God wanted the people who remained to know who it was that had judged this nation. The power that he has. And although the rest of this chapter has been written in the past tense, these two verses are written in the present tense. It describes who God is and what he is able to do. He is the same yesterday, today and forever who was and who is and who is to come. He is the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the creator of all the earth, the supplier and sustainer of all who live here. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be his name. The Lord is his name. There can be no mistake. It's not the Assyrians that have removed Israel. It is God who used the Assyrians as a chess piece with his purposes and prophecies being fulfilled. 
God is a just and merciful judge. And so when he declares his judgment, it will be fulfilled. There can be no doubt that when God speaks, what he says will happen. And so what he said in the past, he once again reminds the hearers of his prophecies. Although the nation of Israel is about to be destroyed, he has made a promise to the house of Jacob. And so now we'll continue reading about the shaking sin of God's mercy from verses 7 to 10. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Armenians from Kerr? Surely the eyes of the Sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations. As grain is shaken in a sieve, not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. Here in verse 7, God shows us that he chose Israel, not because of their goodness, but because of his mercy. He is God over all the nations, over all the earth. He could just as easily have chosen the Cushites or the Philistines or the Armenians. Each of these nations he saved from other nations. But he chose Israel. And so, as Luke 12, 48 says, to whom much is given, much is required. Israel was especially chosen. They were given God's law and became sinful. Yet by the mercy and grace of our God, there were still some that had not sinned from the house of Jacob, which now gets changed to the covenant name of Israel. God promises to shake the, that promised nation through the sieve of the judgment. And even if you have a pebble of sin, you will not make it. All the sinners would die by the sword. That sieve allows the final two tribes the southern kingdom to continue. Why? Because the promises of God that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The promises that he made to King David, that David's line would still continue. And so here we see the nation as a whole will be broken. But there will be a sin. And there will be a respite and some will make it through, a remnant. If this was to be the end of the book, it would be a difficult prophecy to understand. But there are still five more verses. Five more verses where we see the salvation promise for the future. Let's read verses 11 to 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, 
never again to be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. We now get to see so much more than the previous readers of Amos had seen. We get to hear about that day. That day when God will take the broken and fallen tent of David, the nation that is made up of the children of Abraham, and repair it, restore it, and build it back up. That day will be a day when God himself fixes what is broken in this world, where he restores the line of David and the heirs of Abraham into their rightful place. And after that day will come, as verse 13 says, more days, days of plenty, days of reward. When will this day happen? Who will be a part of this nation? Actually, the answer is found in the New Testament. James tells us in the book of Acts, where he quotes from Amos at the Council of Jerusalem. Let me just give you a bit of context. Paul and Barnabas had been preaching to non-Jewish people, and the church were wondering if they were able to be a part of God's kingdom. And so this council had come together to make a decision on whether the gospel was only for the Jews or for others as well. And so when James speaks to this council, he quotes from Amos the verses we just read in Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 19. And God's word says this, when they had finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. It ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. And the remnants of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, that have been known for the ages. James continues, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Did you pick that up? James was saying that the words of the prophets are in agreement that God is taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Gentiles were non-Jewish people. Many of us are Gentiles, if not all of us. God has promised that his chosen people, the church, will possess the remnant of Edom. What that means is they will possess the entire promised land. And that will include all the nations that bear his name to do these things. We are part of that Israel. He promises a time when food will be harvested well beyond the season of harvesting. In fact, all the way through to the season when the next seed is being sown. It will be a time when you will work and you'll be rewarded with abundance. And his people, the remnant of men, who seek God, that is the church, will be planted in their own land, never to be uprooted. And because we have recently finished preaching through the book of Revelation, we know what that means. There is an eternity waiting for us where we will work and see the reward of God. We will have one king, and his name is Jesus. He will be the king of kings, as verse 17 says. All the nations will see it. We recognize that the curse placed on the earth from Adamson will be lifted up. We recognize we will see God's goodness everywhere. We will be able to drink our wine and eat our food. What a promise and a future to look forward to. These verses show us that the curse of sin from the time of Adam, that curse that caused every single one of us 
to be separate from God, the curse that made us sinners, that curse will be removed and cause all the judgments of the book of Amos to come on us. Never. Each one of us will have that curse removed from us. This leads us to the most important question of all. Who is in that remnant? And how can I be a part of it? As James said in verse 19 of Acts chapter 15, it's not difficult for Gentiles to turn to God. Those non-Jewish people, all they have to do is believe the good news. And the good news is that we can't remove the curse. There's nothing we can do. But Jesus can and has done so. He paid the ultimate price by dying on the cross. He paid for the curse with his own blood, which became a perfect sacrifice, meeting the need for God. On our own, we'll be like that stone, stuck in the sieve, not able to get through as God shakes us. And we'll be removed and thrown away. But with Jesus, he reshapes us so that we have a new body. We become new creations with a new righteousness. And then we are able to pass through the sieve of righteousness and be found in this new and incredible future promised for the children of Abraham. And Galatians promises us that if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Because we belong to Christ, we are part of Israel. We are part of those from Abraham's seed who become the house of Jacob. And God will plant us in the new Jerusalem forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we are so thankful for your word. We are thankful that when we read through a book of Amos, even though there are judgments and judgments and judgments, there is a promise. There is a promise of a future where you reign. There is a promise that we can come to you through the good news of Jesus. Father, look into our lives, look into our hearts. See if there be any wicked way within us. Help us to confess our sins before you, to walk in the paths of righteousness, and to follow your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In our final song that we will sing, there is a stanza that says, We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we will walk by faith and not by sight. As you wait for that day, let us continue the work that God has called us to do. Let us walk by faith. Will you stand together and sing, By faith we see the hand of God.
Thank you for being with us this morning. We're going to finish our service by saying the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.